I've gone over the LC tank oscillator before. If energy is put into this, then the capacitor will discharge into the inductor, which will discharge into the capacitor, which will discharge back into the inductor, which will discharge back into the capacitor, back and forth, back and forth, to form a sinusoidal wave. The problem is the energy decays. So over time, in fact very quickly, this will just settle down to nothing. And you obviously cannot just hook up power directly into it. It's not a chip you feed. If you hook up power, it's just going to charge up to maximum and sit there. So somehow you have to give it a little bit of power. Just a little bit. Every time it loses some, you have to replace that power without putting too much in it. If you don't give it enough, it'll decay anyway. If you give it too much, it'll start slamming against the rails or even just sit at the top. There are multiple ways to do this. I have seen it hooked up to a common emitter amplifier. I've seen it hooked up to an op amp. And the way it's hooked up to an op amp is really cool, but I can't get them to work. I've seen YouTube videos. I have links saved to YouTube videos of people doing it in a breadboard with the same parts I used and it works fine on theirs. It doesn't work for me. I can't do it. I don't know why. I don't know why. But there was one circuit that did work, hooking it up to a common base amplifier. I'm hoping this is going to work for other oscillators in the future, but at least it does work for one called the Hartley Oscillator. The Hartley Oscillator is a little peculiar, at least at first, because it uses two inductors in series. Squeak. Squeak. Now two inductors in series just add their inductances together. The very basic introductory versions of the Hartley oscillator you'll see in textbooks or tutorials online talk about a double tapped transformer and all this stuff. You don't need it. This is just discrete inductors. This is just two little inductors out of your kit. The idea is as it oscillates, you tap the middle and you anchor this to a voltage. This is how the op amp one works. You actually anchor this to ground so that you have positive on one side and negative on the other, and then you can use that to, to do some gain stuff. I hope to show you in the future once I get it working. But the point is, it oscillates just like it was a single inductor, but having two inductors allows you to tap the middle. So let me go ahead and set up a dual-sided supply this time. Common base amplifiers work both ways. So we'll do that. And then we'll do the common base amplifier just like I showed you before. And there it is, nice and simple. Here's your bias. Here's your coupling capacitor for the emitter. The input goes into the emitter across the emitter resistor through the coupling capacitor into the base. The output comes across out the capacitor to the load. That's your common base amplifier. But we have an LC tank. The LC tank, and the reason I think it works for me with the common base amplifier rather than the other circuits, is we're not just plugging this into the amplifier, we're integrating it into it. We're making it part of the amplifier. This collector resistor actually is gone. We don't use it. The LC tank is the collector resistor. Here's the two series inductors in place of the collector resistor, and here is the capacitor just across the inductors. So here's your oscillation. So according to the site I got this off of, the LC tank acts as a variable impedance for the collector. If you remember, the gain of a common base amplifier is roughly equal to the collector impedance and the base emitter junction impedance, the ratio between them. And the junction impedance, the dynamic thermal resistance, whatever you want to call it, because we have a small signal, this thing is designed for small signals, the current only varies by a very small amount. That shouldn't be changing very much. You know, in the grand scheme of the universe, this RE should not be changing terribly much at all. But RC is varying. And I'm going to have to hand wave a few of these physical details. This is more of an explanation than a deep dive, because it's getting into physics I don't understand. But the essence of it is the LC tank, the oscillator will not be denied. If there is energy in this oscillator, it will oscillate. It doesn't matter what you hook it up to. It doesn't matter what's going on. You can put energy in and you can take energy out, but it's going to oscillate if it has energy. That's just a fact of life. It's very forceful. So the transistor is going to try and open and close and open and close the way it does, but that's going to mean nothing unless the LC tank allows it to conduct. So just the current going back and forth through this LC tank because there's no other path to the collector other than out the load, but the oscillation causes the 
collector to be able and not able alternately to conduct. So it's controlling the gain, sort of, dropping it down to zero and then bringing it back up. That was step one. Step two, obviously, is we don't have an input signal. What do we have? The oscillator is also the signal input taken from in between the two inductors, which allows the ratio of the inductors to have effects on certain things. But what's basically happening here is there is energy in this oscillator and it is oscillating. It just is. So it's controlling the gain. The gain is going up and down because the oscillation voltage at the collector is going up and down. But it is also driving energy in and out of the capacitor connected to where the signal goes. And the common base amplifier, that current goes across the emitter resistor through the coupling capacitor into the base just like I already showed you. So the oscillator is controlling the gain and the oscillator is controlling the input. So the input causes the shape. The signal goes up, down, up, down, and that is what's causing the transistor to try and open and close. The, the, the tap point here is driving current across the base that's causing the transistor to open and close. But the transistor can open and close all at once. This also has to be providing it with a current path. You know, the current can't be going the other way or whatever. So physics, physics, there is an equilibrium reached where the gain that the oscillator applies to the amplifier and the signal that the oscillator applies to the amplifier end up providing just that little bit of energy it needs. Every time around, the transistor is going to be turning on and off and on and off. It's not, you know, necessarily a class A amplifier anymore. It's an amplifier structure, but we're not amplifying a signal. We're trying to preserve the signal. We're trying to feed the signal. So it's giving it a burst and knot and burst and knot, and it's keeping the oscillation going. And you control this with the emitter resistor, because that's, the, that's the, the key thing here. Now, I've said that the primary driver of the gain is the base emitter junction dynamic resistance, but the resistance, the actual resistor on the emitter does have an effect. It just has much less of one. So it's more of a fine-tuning control knob. So by changing the value of the emitter resistor, you, you reach an equilibrium, and this is where you use a, a potentiometer or whatever to test out what value you need. There's not much math you can do here. you got to experiment a bit. But you can turn this resistor up and down, and there's an equilibrium point, and if you go to one side of that equilibrium point, too much energy is going to go in, and your oscillator is going to just, just garble itself. Or you can put not enough energy in, and it'll dampen immediately, and your oscillator will just show a flat line because it's trying to put energy in, but it's not. And then, of course, if there's no oscillation, then it's, it's, just, it's just a baseline. So you tune the emitter resistor, and that gives you the proper equilibrium between these two things. And conceptually, you can think of it as changing the magnitude of the signal because you have a certain amount of current going across this resistor because of the signal input and then changing the value of the resistor changes how much current goes through the base, how much you're holding the signal back or letting it go. I wish I could explain it better, but I'm just going to have to hand wave and say there's an equilibrium between those two things. But it works, and I will show you on my oscilloscope. And there's an alternate version of this called the Colpitts oscillator, which is two capacitors and one inductor. I'm going to try and hook it up and see if there's anything interesting about that, worth making another video over. But mostly it just has different properties. It's useful for, I don't know, different frequencies or whatever it is. It behaves slightly differently, but it's basically the same thing. So there it is. My idea for the future is to try to swap out this LC tank for other types of tank oscillators, oscillator cores, and see if I can get it working that way. But for the moment, let's just look at the one I do have working. And I know someone is going to complain about my long wires again. I know. I've done a couple videos about it. I know. I'm not just a madman who doesn't know how to learn. It's okay. So I'm going to use a plus five minus five volt power supply. And I always have loose wires. There we go. This trace on my board is, is pretty crappy. So let's just freeze it for a moment. And hello, oscillation, it actually works. And yes, we've got the, the RF interference. I'll go over that in a moment. Hold on. For my bias, I'm using a 10K and a 1K resistor. For the coupling capacitor between the base and the 
negative supply, it's 100 nanofarads. The emitter resistor is 100 ohms. The inductors are 10 microhenries and 100 microhenries. The capacitor in the tank is 4.7 nanofarads. The capacitor for the input, essentially, going from the midpoint of the inductors to the emitter is 10 nanofarads. The output capacitor is 100 nanofarads. The output load is 10k ohms, and then you take the voltage across the 10k ohm resistor. So it's exactly the same as the common base emitter circuit I already showed you, except I'm using obviously different component values and I've got the tank swapped in. So you can do your standard technique to measure the circuit. You pick a wave and you line it up at the center, pick another wave, and line it up at one of the divisions. Look at the size of the division, times however many is your wavelength, inverted for your frequency. And I get about 240 kilohertz for this signal. If you do the formula 1 over 2 pi times the square root of inductance times capacitance, and the inductance is just in series, so add the two inductors. It's inductor 1 plus inductor 2 as the inductance. If you do that calculation, it comes out to 221 kilohertz. So for, again, a breadboard setup with entry-level cheap parts, that's a great accuracy. And my wire went loose again. See, I'm dealing with loose wires. It's going to wiggle it. There we go. So, there it is. There's the oscillator. It's oscillating. And it's oscillating stably. The voltage is not going up or down. Now, about the RF interference, doggone it, about the RF interference, I swear this breadboard is going to be the death of me. So, right here, watch what happens if I touch these wires. It's perfect, isn't it? It just went away, this freeze frame. You can see it's this lovely, lovely wave. All I have to do is touch these wires, and it takes away most of it because I'm, I'm, I guess, robbing the waves of energy or whatever. But here's another trick. What if I take that capacitor out? Let me just take it in my finger and pluck it off the board. Here it is. It's still working, and it's working better. What's going on? Parasitic capacitance. The nastiness right now... Not that, but this nastiness, this nastiness right here, if I freeze frame, is RF interference. And it goes away when I touch these wires. I could probably wrap them in foil and it would also go away because it's causing interference in the other circuit. This is generating it. This, it's, not, it's not receiving. It's not receiving, it's generating it. So I'm, like I said, I'm robbing it of energy. But the important part is when I take the capacitor out, it's still got a capacitor somewhere in the breadboard, perhaps multiple ones, some along the power traces, some here and there. The point of this capacitor is not literally to carry the energy, to carry the current between the emitter and the base. The point of it is to do so with low impedance. If this was on a PCB with no stray capacitance to speak of, or almost none, this capacitor would be necessary for a well-functioning circuit. But here, I've got a whole bunch of it all over my breadboard. It's got all kinds of low impedance pads it can follow to that base to get a good enough result. So, in other words, breadboards are wonderful and they also suck. But there's your oscillator. You may see me with a new breadboard soon because I'm going to chuck this one out the window. But enough of that for now. I've explained pretty much as well as I can, and I hope to do more interesting explanations with other oscillators in the future. For now, I'll be seeing you.